in Genesis chapter number 15 this morning, picking up where we left off throughout Sunday school this year. And this morning, we're going to look at something pretty significant where Abraham actually receives the promise of Isaac from the Lord, where he specifically talks about these things. We've seen a lot of different things happen over the last few weeks. We've seen Abraham and Lot be together. We've seen them uh, split apart. We've seen Lot go his own separate way. We've seen Lot uh, captured and rescued last week. And so now we're here into Genesis chapter number 15, where we see another promise that God makes to Abram. And one that, you know, if you're just familiar with the book of Genesis and you've read on through, that Abram didn't actually understand. And later you'll see that he goes on and tries to help God out with fulfilling that promise. And we'll get to that later, but when God promised this here, it might have seemed unbelievable and it might have seemed impossible, but ultimately what I really would like for you to get a hold of from this message today is that when God says something and God promises something, that it is 100% true, that it's going to take place, that it's going to come to pass, no matter how unbelievable it might seem. So look in Genesis chapter number 15 with me in verse number 1 where it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, lo one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own vows shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto them, So shall thy seed be. So, Again, if you remember a few weeks ago when I was teaching, I was talking about how you've got Abram's people and the flocks there and everybody that followed with them and the servants and the people that were taking care of the land. And then you have Lot's people. And, and we're talking about multitudes of people. But another thing that's important that a lot of people, especially more so back then than today, I'm not saying it doesn't happen today, but way more so back then, is that they were so much more concerned for what was going to happen long after they were gone. And one of the things that was really important to Abram, that he basically brings up to God here, is that I don't have any children. And I, like, sure, I have all these things, but when I'm gone, you know, it's just going to go to somebody else that isn't from me, that doesn't share the same blood as me, and it's not in my family. And that was a big problem to Abram. And so God specifically makes the promise to him that there that he is going to have a son, and that this son is going to come from him. And you know, a lot of times we tend to, and I, I'm getting way ahead of what the story is, but I think a lot of us are just familiar with the story and what happens, that Abram is promised this, he goes and he tells his wife, they think this is just ridiculous, there's no way because we're way too old to have a child at this point, it's not going to happen. And then Abram goes and thinks, well, we can just use one of the women servants and have a child by her, and that's how they end up having Ishmael. But Ishmael wasn't the one that was promised. Isaac was the one that was promised. God promised that he was going to have them that way. But what happens is a lot of times when God makes us promises and when we read about promises in his word is people will almost try to kind of help God out and try to read into the Bible and see, oh, well, I'm promised this, so I'm going to go and forsake the Lord in this area to receive this promise, if you understand what I'm saying. I'm going to completely stop coming to church, thinking about God, or caring about anything that's in the Bible, and go make a bunch of money so that I can have the mansion that God promised me. Well, the mansion God promised is in heaven, right? So that's an extreme example. But, you know, people will look at things or maybe over-spiritualize something when it doesn't really need to be. 
for example, when you're reading about the different <clears throat> healings in the books, in, in the Gospels, and when you're seeing Jesus walk around, and you're seeing uh, people come to him with physical impalements, or even if you think about Lazarus, when Lazarus died, when Jesus initially came and to Lazarus' family, they were distraught, and Jesus said, he'll rise again. And what did they say? They didn't think Lazarus was going to physically rise from the dead right then. They said, well, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection. You know, and like in the way that we talk to people about how, hey, you don't need to be sorrowful that your saved loved one died. You know, we'll see them again. And so they thought Jesus was just saying, well, you know, he'll rise again in the resurrection someday. But Jesus meant, no, he's going to rise again now. And he just yells out, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. So there are many instances in the Bible where God says an unbelievable thing that ends up actually completely coming to pass as he promised with no weaseling around to try to get to that end conclusion. And so what I want you to think about this morning is as we're reading and we're talking about a very old man and we're talking about an even older woman that God promised them that they were going to have a child together and that later on we actually see that come to pass. Now the other thing with this is that this is not something that happened immediately. Sometimes God's promises take years to take place, but just because it takes a long period of time doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. For example, it's been about 2,000 years since Jesus ascended up into heaven, and you know what he said he's going to do? That he's going to come back for us. You know, but it's been thousands of years. And you know what? There's people out there that say, where is he? Why hasn't he come back? You know what? A day with the Lord is a thousand years. It is a thousand. So we can look and see that things don't always work out the same way that we do. But it doesn't mean that the God we serve is lying to us or not capable. It's important to understand that God is the one that created literally everything that we have, everything that we are. Even if you look at a giant building out there and, you know, say, well, a man built that. There was an architect behind it. There was a construction crew. Right, but God literally created the architect that designed it. He created his mind that designed it. He created the hands and gave the workers that built it strength to do it. Everything in this world is God's. He's the one that designed the fabric of everything. So if he says something's going to happen, he has the power and the authority to do it. So what we need to do is focus on our faith and our strength and our confidence in our God so that when God tells us something or so that when we're reading about the promises in the Bible, we don't think about them with some level of doubt in our mind of wondering whether or not this is something that's possible or this is something that maybe it'll happen, but having the full faith and confidence that God said this was going to happen, I believe it's going to happen, even if it doesn't happen tomorrow, even if it doesn't happen in five years, this promise will be fulfilled someday. So we left off in verse number six, where Abram is delivered this promise that he's going to receive, you know, a son. And in verse number six, you see it says, he believed in the Lord and it counted to him for righteousness. Another point to make is that salvation has always been and will always be by grace through faith alone. You say, well, how did Abraham get saved by faith if Jesus didn't you know, die on the cross? Yet? Well, he got saved by faith, by believing God. And you notice that there was not a gospel presentation here where God is explaining to Abram that he's going to send his son into the world and he'll live a sinless life and that he'll die on the cross. But the thing is, he believed God and that faith was counted to him for righteousness. Salvation hasn't changed over the years as more things have happened. What is the, What stayed the same is faith and that it's believing. There was never any point in time in the Old Testament and there never will be any point in time in the future where someone gets saved any other way than faith. And you see, Abram here, it's not saying directly that he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, but it does say 
that his faith was counted for righteousness the same way that our faith is counted for righteousness. So when you're reading through the Old Testament and you see people's faith and you see people talk about the faith, and you're reading in the book of Hebrews in chapter number 11, where we're going down all these different people in the Old Testament and how righteous they are, and you read even about Lot in the New Testament, and it says that righteous man, would you look at any of these guys that are listed and think about their works and think that they're a righteous man, you know? But why does God look at them with righteousness? Because of their faith. It's the same exact way that our faith today in 2024 saves us the same way that all the way back then it was their faith that saved them. It's always been my faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It might not sound exactly the same in terms of what they were believing, and it might be a little less clear. That's why when Jesus came, you had so many people that were just so backwards on everything because they needed him to explain it. Actually, if you'll read... When Jesus rose again from the dead, he didn't immediately just ascend back up into heaven. Most of his time spent between now and then was literally just sitting with the Old Testament. Because you got to think, the New Testament wasn't written at that time. Nothing was written at that time. Opening up the Old Testament with them and showing all of the different things that were prophesied of him. And you know what? Most of the Old Testament, in some way, shape, or form, is prophesying of Christ. All the different things that are rough to get through in the book of Leviticus, or learning about the different beasts, or learning about anything else like that, Jesus is all over that. The blood of Christ is all over that stuff. I'll bet they didn't really think much about the story about putting the blood on the doorposts when the death angel was coming through Egypt. But you know what? It's pretty clear after you watch the Savior die on the cross and spill it out his blood that covers all of their sins. And so just explaining all of these things. But every step of the way, it's been faith. Even in that story that I just referenced about Egypt, it was them hearing that putting the blood on the doorpost was going to save them and was going to spare them. And then they did it and they were saved. What did they do while they were in the house? Did they fight off the death angel somehow? Did they protect themselves in any way, shape, or form? No, they just stayed under the blood. The same exact way that we just stay under the blood. By faith, resting in that God is enough. In verse number seven, it says, And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an ifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation, whom they shall serve, will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, and the river Euphrates. Now, I want you to think about something with me. Really just kind of go along this thought process with me, because the first time that I really thought about this, I thought it was just a really cool thing. So, notice that God promises him that he's going to inherit land and a significant portion of land, all right? And in 
verse number uh, 8, he said, And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And then God goes on and he tells him that he wants him to perform a specific sacrifice. And then in when Abram falls asleep, the Lord comes to him again and starts kind of explaining what's going to happen long in the future from this point where Abram is initially hearing about this. So he's talking about the captivity in Egypt. He's talking about them eventually being delivered out of Egypt and eventually led into the promised land. Now, this is long after Abram dies at this point. I mean, right now we're still talking about Abram. This is before we even get to Abraham, right? So this is long before that. I mean, we're talking a period of 400 years. And so notice God's making him a promise that basically long into the future, at least 400 years from now, you're going to inherit this land. All right? And I want you to think about this. If someone came to you and told you today that they've got the deal of a lifetime, and maybe just hypothetically, someone comes to you and says, 400 years from now, the entire state of Ohio, yours. All the taxes that people pay, instead of paying to the government, they'll pay to you. You will be the true owner of all the land at least 400 years from now. You know, who cares? You know, you're not going to be here. None of us will be here. Uh, my great, 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 be here, uh, probably, 400 years from now. So it's not really something that would matter. It would be of much significance. But again, there's the part of it where we talked about earlier about how, you know, there is... <laughs> A care for the descendants and just a care for your physical family that you want them to do well and you want it to be your family and your bloodline and your name but this is not what that is you know it's very important to understand God is not the God of the dead but of the living and when you're reading later on in the New Testament and you're reading other places and when we see that phrase that God is not the God of the dead but the God of the living who are the three people that are referenced there? It's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they're long dead at that point, right? Well, no. Because when you're saved, you live forever. Your physical body might die, but your soul lives forever. So God is making him a promise, yes, about this physical land, Yes, about his physical descendants that will inhabit this land. But I think something that we discount that we claim they might not have really fully understood, and granted, they didn't understand it as well as we do today with the book of Revelation and all these other things. They knew and understood resurrection. They were well aware of that, and they all knew the they would rise again. They did not fear death because they knew they had the deliverer of God. You can even read in the book of Job. Job was aware of the resurrection. Job knew that he would rise again from the dead someday. Earlier when I was talking about Lazarus, this is before Jesus has died on the cross and he rose again from the dead. These people had never even seen somebody rise again from the dead, but by faith, they believed that they would rise again from the dead. So, just because they haven't seen it, they still believe it. We have people today that it's just common knowledge at this point, all throughout the United States of America, that Jesus physically lived, that Jesus physically died, and that Jesus physically rose again from the dead. They have record of that happening. Really, if they've read their Bible a little bit more, they've got record of that happening to another person in Lazarus, but people still don't believe it. They write it off as well as they stole his body away or, or something else like that. These people have never seen someone rise again from the dead, but they still believed it. And they still fully understood it, just knowing and understanding their deliver and knowing who the God is that they serve. So I think what a lot of times people do in mistakes, and I'm very guilty of this too, is looking through that group of people in Hebrews chapter 11 and thinking about how 
how is David, you know, great? David did a lot of horrible things in his life. David, you know, committed that sin with Bathsheba. David was, you know, really departing from the Lord. And then you get further along by that. You look at Abram and some of the things that he did. You look at Jacob and some of the things that he did. And you just go down this list and think, how are these people on here? But really, when you read into this and you understand what they believed and you understand their faith and you understood their confidence in God, they had a lot of faith. And so much faith that Abram really didn't even question God initially when this promise was made. There was no question about, you know, oh, well, how is this going to happen? Or I don't really understand how this is going to happen. You know what Abram's mindset was when God gave him that promise? First of all, he believed it. But then the second thing he wanted to know was, well, how can I know that this is going to happen? And God told him, make a sacrifice. And he told him, it's going to happen. Here's all the things that's going to happen and some of the things that are going to lead up to it. And Abram just walked away. All right, I believe it. You know, we should strive to do that way in our lives. We need to strive to do that way to truly trust God and truly have faith in all the different things that he's promised. You know, it's easy to come to church on Sunday and pick up the Bible and say that you believe it. But how about on Monday, Tuesday, and we're here on Wednesday, and then Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, when you don't necessarily have anybody but the people around you in your day-to-day -day life that are there, do you still believe the promises of God? Do you sincerely believe in the return of Christ, in the resurrection? Do you sincerely believe that there is a God that is looking at this world and is judging this world, that there is the Son of God came down to this earth physically, lived a sinless life, that he performed all the different miracles that were written, that he died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose again three days later, and sincerely dwelling on those things. And really, if there's anything that you can take away from this lesson this morning, I just want you to understand the attitude that Abram had towards all of these things, and that God was able to just say something to him, and then just without question, he believed him. And he asked for a little bit more assurance of it, and he asked for more details or anything else. And all God told him was that, hey, well, 400 years from now, at least 400 years from now, there's going to be a captivity, and all these people are going to be taken, but then eventually they'll be delivered into that land. Abram, just good enough for me, you know? And that's what I want, that's what I think everybody should be thinking about. And it's hard. It's not easy to do. And it's not easy to think about that. That's why all the people that, you know, give their adherence to a workspace salvation and thinking that they need to keep all the commandments in order to be saved or be a good person in order to be saved or whatever definition that they make about how to be saved. But having faith is not just a simple thing all the time. Sometimes it's hard. You know, it's hard walking around when the whole world as we know it, every day it seems like, is lacking faith and just more so not believing in anything. God does, not believing in the miracles of God. And then we still, in the midst of that, have to stand strong knowing, yes, we believe in the Bible. Yes, we believe the things that God has done. Yes, we believe that God is who he says he is and that the miracles that he promised are still miracles today. That the promises that he's made have already come to pass or are still going to come to pass. In a day where we live in a, just an era of doubters that think Jesus isn't coming back again, He's been dead, he still is dead, and everything like that. No, he's alive. And we all sat together last Sunday and were just singing and praising the Lord and reminiscing on the fact that Jesus rose again from the dead and that he didn't die after that. He ascended up into heaven. Amen. And these are things that we regularly should be thinking about, regularly thinking on, so that when we come through a challenge in life, so that we come through some type of hardship, we understand that we have direct access to the same God that promised a very well past their age couple a child, and then well beyond that point in time when that promise was made, delivered that promise to them. We have that same God that raised up Lazarus from the dead. We have that same God that raised the people that couldn't walk, that gave sight to the blind, that gave hearing to the deaf, we serve the same God that performed all of these miracles. He can take care of our problems too. Still today. There's not a difference. We can look at all of the different 
know, solutions that we have today, and I'm thankful for the medical system, and I'm thankful for all of the different things that we see hospitals do and everything like that. I still believe, though, with all of the technology and all of the advancements, that the great physician is the most important one. And I think that if there's no prayer involved, and I think that no matter what the doctors do, that it's no guarantee for anything. And it's no guarantee even when prayers are involved. But I'm telling you, I haven't been around that long, but I've seen some amazing medical miracles that have no scientific explanation at all. The great physician is still healing today. Amen. And he's still performing miracles in our lives. And you know what? He's still coming again. So with all of the doubters that we see and all of the different uh, just challenges that we go through on a regular basis, I challenge you to believe God and to have faith in all of the different things that God has done for us and know and have the full confidence, the same confidence that Abram had in God at this point in time. To continue to have that in your life for all of the different promises that are in the Lord God. So let's close in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you so much for all the good us, Lord. I thank you for the different promises that you've given us, Lord, and for just the ability to be able to look into your word and understand the promises that you've given us, Lord, and just have full faith and confidence in you and the different things that you do. Lord, I'm so thankful for the promises that you've shown me, Lord, in my life, and the promises that you've shown all those in this room, Lord. And most of all, we just thank you for the promise of salvation and the return of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Dismissed.